Hello and welcome to this uh, uh, online event uh, held by the International Inequalities Institute um, at the LSE. My name is Francisco Ferreira and I'll be the, uh, the chair of the event today, which is entitled, uh, Why is Latin American Inequality So Extreme? Um, before I introduce our very distinguished panel, let me uh, share my screen uh, to just say that this event, uh, let me make sure I'm sharing the right screen, apologies. Um, all right, uh, I hope you can uh, see this and, uh, and if you can't see it, um, I hope uh, Antigone or someone will tell me. But this event, um, which is, uh, boasts a fabulous panel, is actually the launch of a, a, something called the Latin American and Caribbean Inequality Review. And I just want to say a few words about that before uh, giving the word to my fellow pan panelists. So the Latin American and Caribbean Inequality Review uh, that we're launching today, what is it? It's an, an independent research effort, a collective independent research effort um, sponsored by the four institutions you see at the bottom here, uh, the LSC, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and Yale University, um, that aims to understand, um, take stock of our knowledge and advance of our understanding of the nature, causes, and consequences of the multiple inequalities that plague the Latin American and Caribbean region. It is partly inspired by the Deaton Review, which is uh, led by another panel uh, headed by Professor Sir Angus Deaton, um, which focuses on inequality in the UK and a few other advanced economies. Our effort focuses on Latin America. It's uh, going to be a five-year exercise led by a panel of 15 scholars that I'll introduce to you in a moment. Um, a majority of economists, but also some sociologists and political scientists. We plan to commission between 25 and 30 papers from a broader range of researchers and scholars from across Latin America and the Caribbean and beyond, um, most of which will be featured in an edited volume. There'll be a number of workshops and conferences along the way to discuss our findings and results. And a final summary will be presented in a second volume written by the panel itself. So who is the panel? Um, I know there's a little delay in my slides, but hopefully you can see uh, their pictures already. There are 15 of us, as I said, Ana de la O, who is at Yale, Ana Maria Ibanez at the IDB, Andres Velasco, who is with us today from the LSE, Facundo Alvaredo from the Paris School of Economics, Florencia Torche, who is a sociologist at Stanford, uh, myself, Francois Bourguignon from the Paris School of Economics, Julian Messina from the Inter-American Development Bank. And then if you can see the next slide, I hope, Marcela Eslava at Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Nora Lustig, who is with us today from Tulane University, Horacio Atanasio from Yale University, Raquel Fernandez from NYU, Richard Blundell from uh, UCL, Santiago Levy, who is also with us today from Brookings, and Sonia Krutikova from the Institute for Fiscal Studies, um, also here in London. And we're very fortunate to be ably assisted by Antonella Bancalari and Valentina Contreras, who are part of the team. Um, the review will be organized in five broad themes. The first one seeks to establish the facts of levels and trends of inequality. Um, we are now at a time when people use multiple data sources to look at different kinds of inequalities, and they don't always agree. So we'd like to understand um, what we actually know and can be co confident of in terms of levels and trends of inequality, not only in income, but also in wealth, education, health, and specifically land. Um, the second theme looks at inequality of opportunity and the closely related topic of intergenerational mobility. Um, how fair and mobile are our societies? And what is the role the changing role probably of family and local communities in shaping inequalities for the next generation. Moving from families and communities to markets, um, of course, most economic inequality is realized in markets, either for labor, for capital, or for goods. 
and issues of market power um, and uh, uh, concentration of capital and the functioning of labor markets will feature prominently. Markets aren't the only determinants. Um, you know, there are families, there are markets, and then there are, uh, and then there are, um, uh, uh, then there is the government. So the, the, the fourth theme focuses on what governments do and don't do to redistribute in the region, um, looking both at the revenue collection side, the taxation side, and the spending uh, side on redistribution. So there you've got, uh, uh, there you've got your, your feminism communities, markets, and governments. Um, now, of course, if there is a high inequality equilibrium, which we postulate as a hypothesis to motivate our work, that equilibrium is probably generated by the interaction between economic and political inequalities. Inequalities in political power and voice and participation are fundamental in the region. And the fifth theme will look in particular at that. So that's a very broad and brief outline of what we hope to do in the next five years with this um, uh, eminent panel that I've, uh, that I've introduced to you today. And today, um, I'm delighted that we have three of those panel members and two illustrious discussants uh, to help us um, launch that effort here at the LSE, uh, talking about why Latin America, uh, Latin American inequality is so extreme. So let me introduce them very, very briefly and then just get started. So uh, we have Professor Nora Lustig, who is the Samuel Z. Stone Professor of Latin American Economics and the founding director of the Commitment to Equity Institute at Tulane University. We have Santiago Levy, who is a non-resident senior fellow with the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., former vice president for sectors and knowledge at the IDB and a distinguished career in public service in Mexico before that. We have Andres Velasco, our, my colleague here at the LSE, a professor of public policy and dean of the School of Public Policy here at the LSE, um, also distinguished economist and former finance minister of Chile. We are delighted uh, to have two discussants that uh, will add a lot to our debate today. Marcela Melendez is the chief economist for Latin America and the Caribbean at the UNDP. It's also affiliated with the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota. And uh, Jim Robinson, James Robinson, is the Reverend Richard Pearson Professor of Global Conflict Studies and University Professor at the Harris School of Public Policy, University of Chicago, a very uh, distinguished author. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, this panel, very grateful to them for being with us today. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Nora, who will uh, begin. The way we we'll work is we'll have um, three presentations from the panelists, about 15 minutes each, and then the discussions will be uh, 10 minutes each, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. So thanks a lot, uh, Nora, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chico. Delighted to be here and delighted to be part of this group of uh, economists and non-economists working in La Cire on such an important topic that has been the focus of my research interest now for a little bit of time. So I will... Uh, I try to do in 15 minutes something that's going to be pretty challenging. So it's going to be mainly highlights of what is uh, behind the persistent inequality in Latin America. And also what can we expect from the COVID-19 aftermath? Because I think that our work in the uh, last year, uh, even though it was not focused on the on the pandemic, I think the pandemic actually introduced some new challenges that would probably will need to be addressed by, by our work. Um, so this is the outline of my presentation. I'm going to go very quickly over the uh, levels and trends, uh, a little bit about the determinants, glimpse at fiscal redistribution work that we do at the, the CEQ Institute, and what can we expect on the future of inequality in the light of the pandemic. So for levels and trends, I think it's very interesting to acknowledge again something that happened in Latin America, especially during the first decade of the century, is that almost in every country we experienced a decline in inequality in the most unequal region in the world. And a decline that was pretty pervasive and unique because it's usual, usually you don't see this phenomenon happening on so many countries 
uh, for a period of time, which was beyond just a couple of years. It almost lasted a decade. So there, in the last 30 years, I'd like to always uh, identify that there were three main periods in terms of inequality trends in Latin America, which is the 90s in which you had uh, rise in the most of the countries, then the 2000s, like I said, a decline, and then more recently, since uh, approximately 2013, the decline has come to a halt. And in some countries, you begin to see a reversal. And this is, again, before the pandemic now. Let me show you a couple of, uh, I'm going to use my laser pointer here. <laughs> Let's see. You know, a couple of, uh, a few graphs here that uh, will show you. you know, this is uh, Gini coefficient around the early 90s circa 2018, anything that's below the diagonal indicates that the Gini coefficient was lower in the recent period compared to the previous one. Uh, for the Gini skeptics, I also have a graph here of the 10 to uh, 90 uh, ratio, and you also see that in most countries it declined. And as I said, you can see how in the 1990s, most of the countries were above the diagonal, which is signaling an increase. It's the 2000s where you see the pervasive decline in practically every single country in the region from the most unequal to the least unequal. And more recently, you see that this is beginning to stop. So this has put Latin America in an interesting context in the sense that if you compare with other regions of the world, it's the one that shows the sharpest decline, still the most unequal, but at least you know it's been declining, which is good news uh, in terms of the 30 year period. In addition, because you had this decline in inequality and in many countries accompanied by high growth during the commodity boom years, what you see also is that there's been a decline in poverty and a rise of the middle classes, something that Chico has worked on uh, quite a bit, especially when he was wearing the World Bank hat before. So these are all pretty much good news that, uh, like I said, were not so um, felicitous in the more recent years. And now with the pandemic, we are facing some new challenges. However, let me just do something like a comment about the data that we're using. Everything that I showed you so far is based on household surveys. And as we know, household surveys are not well designed for many reasons that I can go into now to capture what happens at the top of the income distribution. There's been a lot of work, particularly in uh, the group that is led by Piketty and Saez and Facundo Alvaredo, a member of our group is also a very active uh, part of that, that has been looking at uh, what happens to inequality when you bring in other sources of data, in particular tax returns, but also national accounts. And then the story is not as clear in terms of a story of declining inequality. Here I'm showing you results for Brazil. Uh, the orange line shows what's happened to the Gini coefficient. If you use, sorry, this is income share held by the richest 10%, not the Gini. You can see what happened if you use household survey data. And if you use fiscal data, it's the green. If you use national accounts, it's the blue. And as you can see, the decline is no longer there. So when you bring in capital incomes in particular, the story changes. And this is something that we're planning to explore in our uh, last year to sort of identify what may be behind both what happened in terms of trends and also what may be behind the fact that we do not experience this decline in the uh, share of the top when you include capital income. Same thing with Chile. The story was nicer. <laughs> you know, this is the top 1% in Chile. If you just relied on the household survey, once you bring in the taxes, the top 1% did not experience really a decline and it's pretty much higher than what it is with the household surveys. Same story for Uruguay. And there's now data for many of the countries in Latin America that show the same thing. However, I think that in spite of this, there's an interesting story to be told about what happened primarily to labor income inequality and also to government transfers, which is what explains primarily what happened when you just use household surveys. So the interesting thing is that inequality in the 2000s, inequality 
that is captured using household service, which is primary labor income and transfers both private and public. The decline happened in a great number of countries that are very diverse in terms of whether did they grow or did they stagnate during the period where they commodity importers, commodity exporters, were they governed by the left or by non-left governments? It so happened that in all of them, with this diversity, the decline in inequality took place at different rates, but in all of them, qualitatively, they experienced this decline. So given this uniqueness, a lot of people have been trying to study what were the uh, determinants. Now, I'm just going to mention primarily the uh, high headlines of what, what was found. And this uh, pie chart shows you that the bulk of the decline is explained by a decline in labor income inequality, which is the light blue. The orange is what happened to government transfers, and the gray is what happened to private transfers. So remittances contributed to the decline in inequality, the change in public policy in terms of how government cash transfers became much more pervasive and targeted to the poor and what happened in terms of labor income inequality. So the next question is, why is it that labor income inequality fell during this period? And one common phenomenon, there's been other countervailing and reinforcing factors, but one common phenomenon from the research that we have done uh, with Luis Felipe Lopez Calva and also with uh, Chico and others that, uh, I worked on this type of analysis, including Francois, who is also a member of LACIR. Uh, what we found is that uh, primarily the story is the one that is there was a decline in relative returns to post-secondary education. So the so-called skill premium fell. And that probably has been the result of the fact that the supply of skilled labor outpaced its demand. So our conclusion from the work that we've done comparatively across many countries of those that experienced a decline in inequality is that probably the expansion in education, which took place in the 1990s, lies behind as the most important factor from the policy point of view that helped the process of declining for income inequality in the 2000s. The reinforcing factors, interestingly, well, I mean, not surprisingly, perhaps, was the rise of the left. Uh, there were 10 or 11 countries, depending on your definition of left, that were governed by the left in the 2000s or the 17, because uh, primarily they experienced rising minimum wages and also pro-union, if you want, uh, stances in terms of uh, policies in the labor market. Also, you had a commodity boom in uh, many of these countries, and that resulted in higher demand for low-skilled workers. Of the countervailing forces, the ones that we had identified in some countries is that assorted matching actually became more unequalizing than what it used to be in the past because of uh, marriage parents or parents of choice of partner partners. So in terms of the determinants of more progressive transfers, which is something that uh, I'm glad Jim is here because he, he actually, I think, was a early, a posit, posed this early on. Uh, I mean, there were two types of uh, main, uh, mainly two types of uh, cash transfers that were expanded. The conditional cash transfers is targeted to the poor, and also in many countries, the non-contributory old pay pensions were also expanded. I think that one of the factors that would lie behind, in particular, the conditional cash transfers expansion and here, we're very glad to have also Santiago Levy, one of the inventors of this, is the technological innovation in social policy that occurred in the 1990s. I'm not sure whether Santiago plans to discuss this, but at some point it may be interesting to sort of see what happened also from the point of view of making uh, the government able to reach lots and lots of people in very remote areas with cash. So he had a technological innovation. The politics, and this is, I don't know if Jim plans to go into that, is that democratization and inclusion of previous excluded groups probably facilitated uh, uh, this move towards uh, targeted cash transfers. And uh, the rise of the left created electoral competition which made governments who were non-leftists also adopt this type of policy. Interesting, I mean, let me just show you this graph because you know this, uh, what you have here is what happened to inequality to uh, when you divide the, the uh, countries into left and non-left ones. 
So the average is the gray line. The dash line is the left government, you know, countries governed by the left, and this is the rest. So everybody experienced a decline in inequality, but it was much more pronounced for countries that were governed by, by the left. And what you have here in the vertical lines is when elected governments came to play into place and then when they left. Uh, I said that one of the key policy levers that are probably ended up uh, making the leftists more, uh, in, uh, more equalizing was uh, what happened to the real minimum wages. And again, here you can see the gray is the average for the region. It was primarily driven to what, what happened by countries governed by the left, which is the dash blue line. And this is the non-left, which also experienced an increase in minimum wages, but less pronounced. Okay, and since, uh, like I said, since 2013, the story here became less uh, felicitous, less suspicious. Uh, we have, we're witnessing, if you want, the, the uh, halting of this process of this equalization that it was experienced in the 2000s. And uh, the decline in inequality in some countries has continued because they're still below the uh, diagonal until around 2018 but some of them are already on the diagonal and we're beginning to see countries above the diagonal. So we're experiencing this reversal from what happened in the past. Why that may be happening is probably because there's a lower labor demand and fiscal consolidation, consolidation. market determined wages at the bottom are growing by less. Real minimum wages also began to decline. Uh, and my, uh, I think that the rate of increase in the supply of skilled workers may have also slowed down. We're planning to actually look into these areas in the, um, as part of the LACIR and also accompanying work that we're doing with UNDP, with uh, Luis Felipe Lopez Calva. We want to sort of re examine what happened in the recent decade compared to what happened in the 2000s. Government transfers have also we've been retrenched many countries that had to face fiscal uh, uh, um, constraints that were not uh, before. So they had to be cut down. Uh, in other countries, the uh, transfers were eroded by inflation. And in addition, some countries had to raise taxes and reduce subsidies, which also affected uh, what's happened in inequality in the recent period. So what about fiscal redistribution in the region? I, I don't have time to go into what we're doing at the Institute. I invite you to visit our website. Here is, you can see, just type cqinstitute.org and you will be brought to this and you can click on the country and see what's happening to the countries. But I wanna make two points. First, we don't have a region that is sharing a pattern. The region is very heterogeneous in terms of fiscal redistribution, both because the size of the state varies a lot. As you can see here, you have very small states like Guatemala, very big states like Argentina and Brazil, which compete with the Nordic states in Europe. So lots of heterogeneity. That heterogeneity translates itself also in a lot of heterogeneity in terms of fiscal redistribution, even though Latin America's average, which we show here is below the average in other countries. This is the average of non lack in our database. You do have a tremendous heterogeneity of what countries are able to achieve through fiscal redistribution. This one shows what's happened to taxes and transfers. And uh, it shows two options. I don't have time to go into it, but if anybody's interested, we can discuss it later. The difference between assuming that uh, contributory pensions, pensions of social insurance, are they pure transfers? This would be the reds, or are they deferred income? These would be the blues. So lots of heterogeneity. On average, the redistribution is smaller, but you know, not hugely smaller, but there are some countries that do much more than the average. So uh, interesting to uh, bear that in mind to see what would be the next step. In particular, I think we need to link this to the issue of measuring inequality correctly by bringing in what happens at the top, because that will also give us an idea to what extent you can actually introduce reforms that may address uh, a better system that would tax the top incomes, both through corporate taxes and direct taxes.
better to make it a fairer system. So summing up, the recent history of inequality in America indicates that public policies can change it. Expansion to education, expansion of targeted cash transfers and non-contributory pensions help that. The process has slowed down or even reversed since 2013. And like I said, the fiscal system, they're distributed on average less than other countries, but it's very heterogeneous. So what with COVID-19? And here, I'm not gonna talk about the short-term impact. I wanna link the story of what COVID-19 can bring as a lasting scar through education and how that is linked in turn to the story of declining inequality in the past uh, because of the role of education. I think that we uh, are sort of hoping that with a recovery, some of the uh, damage that was caused by, by the pandemic and the lockdown policies will be reversed. So inequality and poverty that was in the short term, that increase in the short term, that might reverse to different extents. But there's something that according to the research that we've been doing with Guido Neidhofer and Mariano Tomasi may not. And that is the impact of the school closures the differential impact on children from different family backgrounds on how that can actually create more inequality in the future. Poor children will likely end up with lower achievements and many may drop out of school. And this could exacerbate inter lower intergenerational mobility in the future, future higher inequality of opportunity and also future higher wage inequality. This graph shows the gap between the children of poorer families and children of richer families in terms of high school completion rates before the pandemic. It was big. You did have a different uh, rate of complete high, high school completion rates. But the issue is that children of low educational background have not been, been able to replace by homeschooling what uh, was uh, the result of school closures to the extent that richer kids have been. So the gap has been increasing. And according to our uh, data, here there is some, some uh, you know, by how much it's been decreasing. Actually, Mexico and Brazil are the ones in which the, the declines may be the fastest. And according to this, according to this research, we may actually go backward in terms of high school completion rates for children of low income families that will put them at levels that we've seen in cohorts born in the years of 1960s. So it is, we were here, you know, we might be here in the future. So what does this mean? I think that, uh, and, and this is something that uh, I believe last year we'll have to be very mindful about because we're worried about persistent inequality we experienced a reverse inequality. We saw that education played a role because it made uh, the supply of labor, of skilled labor relatively more abundant. And uh, this was, like I said, one of the driving factors in reducing the skill premium, the return, relative returns. So now we may be in the process of witnessing a process, a, 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 the same you know, story, but in reverse. So that could in the future, result in higher levels of inequality which and polarization, which as we know also have consequences in other dimensions that have to do with the politics and uh, social, social stability. And that's why, you know, right now we're Not emphasizing more, the importance so. of, yeah, I'm about to finish, the importance of implementing remedial actions to back, backtrack the impact that we've seen on education, see whether we can avoid this unequalizing force that has been triggered by the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Norm. That was wonderful, incredibly rich, uh, but a very clear line of thought there. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, now there is gonna be a little bit of inequality in timing introduced by this. So I'm gonna to have to ask Santiago and Andres to be um, very, very tight on uh, 10 to 12 minutes, please. And so um, over to Santiago, thanks. I'm trying to stop share. I cannot undo my, there. Thank you, Chico. And um, good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Uh, let me begin congratulating the Institute for International Inequality 
uh, for this great initiative and together with the Institute for Fiscal Studies, Yale and the IDB. Uh, and thank you, Chico, in person in particular for inviting me to be in the panel. Happy to be here with Marcela, with Nora, with Andres and with Jim. So what I'd like to do in, in the 12, 13 minutes that I, that I have left is to share with you some work that I've done jointly with Marcela Melendez in some project at the UNDP that very much overlaps with theme three and theme four of the five themes in which the LACI project is going to be involved, which is the relationship between labor markets, inequality, but also the effectiveness of social protection to reduce inequality. So uh, because we're pressed for time a little bit, just very quickly, you know, we're the, one of the most unequal regions of the world. We have a very high poverty relative to income level, but also very importantly, we grow less than other regions of the world. And mostly because total factor productivity grows very, very slowly. So the question is, what is the role of social protection policies in this, not only for inequality, but also for growth and for social protection? Some language. Uh, so I will be calling formal workers, those that are covered by contributive social insurance programs. Uh, firms are the ones that have some workers covered by these programs. And then if you look on the right side, uh, workers can be formal or informal, depending on whether they do or they don't have coverage of contributive social insurance. But depending on their income levels, they can be poor and they're non, they can be non-poor. So workers can be in any of these four quadrants. And if they're formal, they get contributive social insurance programs. If they're informal, they receive non-contributive social insurance programs which can be health programs, not contributory pensions. If they're poor down here, they have access to poverty programs of the conditional cash transfer types. And if you have universal programs, you get depending, you get everything regardless of which quadrants you are. So that's just simply some language. Um, of course, what matters a lot for here is how the labor market is going to allocate workers into any of the four quadrants. And here's some interesting data about how the labor markets work in Latin America, which really matters for the effectiveness of social protection. So this is some data from the Dominican Republic of transits of individual workers between formal and informal status over one year. If you look at the main diagonal, what you see is that the same workers who began in 2018 as formal, one year later, about 20% at least had changed status from formal to informal, informal to formal. So the point here is that workers can be formal or informal at different points of their lives. And in terms of the previous quadrant, they can be beneficiary of social protection programs that are contributory, or they can also benefit from non-contributory programs. Importantly, not all workers spend the same time in formality. If you follow workers for a long period of time, and we can, we've done this for Mexico, what you see is that workers that work receive about one minimum wage spend about 13% of their time in formality, workers that earn three, about half of their time in formality, and higher income workers, they spend more time in formality. So formality and higher incomes are correlated, but formality and informality doesn't mean rich and poor. This is data from Ecuador in which what we show here is the overlap in the earnings distributions of formal and informal workers. So importantly, the average formal wage is higher than the average informal wage, but there's quite a bit of overlap and not all informal workers are richer than formal workers. So this gives you a flavor of the complexities that occurs in the labor markets. And another important side of the complexities is that most workers are either working self-employed or in micro firms. This is a really important point. It's very large. It's at least 50% of employment in the region. In some countries, 70, 75%. This is an extreme example from Peru. Peru has 3.1 million firms. The United States has 7.8 million firms. So if you look at the size of Peruvian firms compared to the size of, Latin America, of, of US firms, it, it's huge. And the share of workers that are working in small firms is very, very different from the United States. So we have very, very many small firms. And these small firms, there's a lot of research showing that have very low productivity and that most of these low productivity firms are informal. And this matters a lot because the productivity of the economy, you can write it as a weighted average of the productivity of the formal sector than the informal sector. And because there are these productivity differences between sectors, 
The bigger are the resources allocated to the informal sector, the lower is productivity. So with those facts about the labor markets, what about the effectiveness of social protection policies? So the first observation is that they're not very effective. Insurance doesn't work very well in Latin America because workers sometimes get unemployment insurance, sometimes don't. Sometimes they save for a contributory pension, sometimes they don't because they're transiting between formality and informality. And because in for low, low wage workers transit more, they actually have lower insurance. So the effectiveness of insurance is very poor. Poverty programs, which should not be confu confused with uh, uh, insurance programs, transfers like CCTs, there's a lot of evidence that yes, they improve indicators of human capital, but they don't translate well into higher productivity jobs. Workers that are in the lower two quadrants that I showed you before have a lot of difficulty moving into the upper quadrants. And then the impact of these programs on inequality is very contradictory. We tend to think that firms are rich and workers are poor. But in fact, in Latin America, that's not really the case. There are very many, many small firms and the income of the firms is not that different from the incomes of the, of the workers. So redistributing from firm to workers is not the same thing as redistributing from rich to poor. There's a lot of shifting back of contributions. And very importantly, many of these pension regimes are very regressive because only higher wage workers qualify for pensions. These pensions are often subsidized so most of the subsidies that are going to pensions are being captured by the higher income groups. So most of the redistribution is occurring through non contributory programs and targeted transfers, but the basic social insurance mechanism is actually not a very effective redistribution tool. So this is similar to what Nora showed before. What it basically says is that taxes and transfers are very effective in the OECD on average to reduce inequality, but they really are not so effective in Latin America although there's quite a bit of variance, of course, between one region and the other region. Observation two, these social protection policies can also hurt productivity and hurt growth. And very quickly, what happens is that if workers and firms are contributing to contributory programs, but the benefits are less than the costs, you're in fact taxing formality. And there's a lot of evidence from various report work that in fact, these taxes are quite substantial. But in addition, if you give workers free benefits conditional upon their being informal, you are de facto subsidizing informal tax. And then there are many special tax regimes, I don't have time to go into this, that are motivated to help low income entrepreneurs, microcredits, and many measures like that in the region that are actually pushing firms in the direction of smallness. So when you put together everything from the point of view of resource allocation, what you get is, this is again the same diagram that we had before, but basically the social insurance mechanism is taxing workers as they move from, from informality to formality. It's subsidizing people as they move from formality into informality. It's taxing firms as they get bigger because enforcement is bigger or because the tax regime to which firms are subject to actually get back. So, there's a lot of evidence that this segment the labor market, it also generates very bad firm dynamics. So it tends to perpetuate from one to the other and taxes the high productivity sector and subsidizes the low productivity sector. So um, since I'm running for, for time, let me just end with the third observation to say that under these conditions, with this labor markets and this particular social protection structure, socially inclusive growth is very, very difficult. And so this is a caricature of the strategy for social insurance, for social inclusive growth, macro policies to, for stability and for, um, for to raise productivity, and then social protection policies to reduce inequality and to reduce poverty. But for the region, over the last quarter century, in fact, productivity has not increased. And as we mentioned earlier, Inequality fell, but not by much, and is still very, very high. And most workers still have very precarious jobs in, in protected against risk. So the basic point here is that the social protection component part of the, social, the strategy for social inclusive growth is not working with the growth component strategy. It's not that 
we're not doing well the macro job and we're not doing well opening to international markets and competition and all that, that's all well. It's just that this part of the strategy is not working very well. Here are a few examples. Dominican Republic, a country that in the last two decades probably had the best growth in Latin America, duplicated its income per capita. Informality actually went up and the number of workers working self-employed or in small firms went up. Peru, also one of the top performers in terms of growth, still 80% of its worker in tiny million firms, hardly any growth in total factor productivity. Mexico, spectacular performance in terms of manufacturing exports, negative TFP growth, hardly any change in informality, actually some increases in moderate poverty. So growth is coming mostly from factor accumulation, hardly any from productivity. And the impact of that on informality and on inequality is actually. So bottom line, social protection policies in the region as currently structured are doing very little to reduce inequality and are not really conducive to socially inclusive growth. And yes, there are many other factors that are playing into this that are gonna be studied in the DOSFI project, but clearly one of the things that we have to look at carefully in this project is the extent to which social protection policies are working or not working in helping to reduce inequality. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Shiko, for the invitation. Thank you very much, Santiago. That was uh, very rich as well. And, uh, you know, I, I think it highlights for our audience and for all of us the magnitude of the challenge uh, of last year, because as Nora highlighted, you know, so increases in, in spending in social protection contributed to the decline in inequality that we saw, however small it may have been, in, in the 2000s. Um, but in fact, what Santiago has just shown us is that it's an enormously complex picture and it's far from clear that the answer is simply to have more of the same or increase it. Uh, there are lots of design issues. There are lots of interactions between equity and efficiency between um, these policies and the incentives for firms and workers, um, the, the, the size of firms, uh, the formality and informality of workers. So the lives of policymakers that are trying to deal with these questions become uh, very, very difficult. And here we have someone who, um, in addition to being uh, a, a, a distinguished academic economist, has been a policymaker and faced those issues uh, in Chile. So uh, over to Andres Velasco, please. Thank you very much, Chico. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. I am um, honored to be part of this last year group and delighted to be joining Nora, Santiago, Marcela, Jim, uh, and Chico on this uh, launch event sponsored by the LSE. Uh, we heard from Nora and from uh, Santiago two very thorough presentations with lots of facts and lots of data and useful and suggestive interpretations. Uh, I'm going to talk about politics, the relationship between politics and inequality in Latin America, and perhaps inevitably, I'm going to be maybe a little bit more speculative and ideally just a tad provocative uh, in trying to get us to refocus um, some of our thinking uh, on the relationship between inequality and politics. And I'm going to share screen once again, if I may, uh, like everybody else did. Um, okay. Can everybody see that? I hope so, brilliant. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Chico. So I want to begin by making sort of an obvious statement, but sometimes obvious things have to be emphasized. The relationship between inequality and politics is as important a subject as, um, as there is out there. And of course, it deserves to be treated very seriously. I have no doubt that La Cira is going to be treated, be treating it very, very seriously. I do not doubt that there are plenty of scholars, including some colleagues and friends who deal with it in a very systematic way. But I want to begin by simply saying that uh, at the policy level and at the level of political debates, both in the region and about the region, uh, this relationship is not always treated seriously. Uh, and by that, I mean a lot of bits of conventional wisdom become established, get repeated. They become uh, uh, truths, uh, perhaps fake truths, fake news, uh, and they have very, very little bearing. Uh, I mean, a very little connection to reality and very little empirical backing. 
If that sounds like uh, 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 a bit too broad and maybe unjustified, let me give you an example. Uh, we know that there's been a wave of social unrest and street, uh, street protests, and in some cases, street violence in Chile, in Colombia, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, earlier in, in Brazil. Um, so what's behind this? What's behind, say, you know, I'm from Chile, so I will naturally think about what's going on in my country, but more generally, what's behind this wave of social unrest? The conventional wisdom, this is a panel on inequality, so uh, the conventional wisdom uh, uh, turns exactly on that word. Uh, the conventional wisdom is that, yes, rising inequality is behind this wave of social unrest. So the Financial Times, uh, typically quite staid and careful, tells us that inequality in stable Chile ignites the fires of unrest. The Guardian has a couple of qualifiers, but then says widening gulfs between the haves and the have-nots are radical radicalizing many young people in particular. Uh, the Conversation, a pretty influential website, says that uh, 2019 was the year of global unrest spurred by anger at rising inequality. Well, we saw from Noda and we saw from Santiago that rising inequality uh, is not to be found in the data. Um, I have here the Gini coefficient. This is mostly labor income that you can download from the World Bank website. And, uh, you know, in the case of Chile, it is pretty clear that this Gini was appallingly high, um, you know, over uh, 0.55 uh, when the dictatorship ended and democracy returned uh, to Chile in 1990. But that Gini has been falling with, you know, it's not an even drop. Maybe we don't have the data yet. It rose slightly last year because of the pandemic but the trend is very much downward. I do not have a picture here for um, better measure of inequality. As Nora pointed out, this is mostly survey data and the surveys don't capture um, capital income very well. But as we saw from Nora's pictures earlier, if you um, incorporate measures of capital income, what you get is a flat line. Maybe you don't get a decrease uh, but you don't get an increase either. So there are two facts that are repeated out there like sanctified truths. First one is that inequality has been rising. Scholars in the field, including people on this call, know that is simply not true. And secondly, the assertion that rising inequality must be behind social unrest and political instability clearly cannot be true either. Now, if one is going to search a little deeper for a connection between inequality and uh, political unrest and social unrest, uh, maybe one has to, for instance, think about other kinds of inequality. Clearly not all economic inequality types are simply income inequality. Um, there may be inequality of access, there may be inequality of opportunity, there may be other kinds of economic inequality, but increasingly also uh, people uh, from the field of sociology, anthropology, political science are beginning to think about other kinds of inequality that may not be income inequality. There's a prominent sociologist uh, by the name of Araujo in Chile who's been writing quite compellingly about uh, differences in what she calls inequality of treatment. Regardless of income, certain kinds of people, when they stand in line to get service at either a private shop or a public um, agency, they're not treated with equal dignity, with equal respect. Uh, those things are e you know, easy to talk about, hard to measure, but I think we need to uh, be a little bit more careful when we talk about the connection between inequality and politics to specify what kind of inequality are we talking about. Alternatively, it could well be that maybe um, inequality of income did not change, but the sensitivity of this inequality changed in the course of economic development. And of course, people on this call will remember there's a wonderful and very thought-provoking uh, essay by Albert Hirschman dating back to 1973, whose title is precisely The Changing Tolerance for Economic Inequality in the Course of Economic Development. 
I'm perfectly happy to think along those lines, but then one needs a story of why that is that a genie that is not changing very much or perhaps slightly improving was politically acceptable or at least tolerated 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and it isn't today. What else is changing? What other variables are intervening there in the middle that may account for this changing relationship between inequality first, political perceptions, and then political actions, unrest, uh, insatisfaction, instability, et cetera, et cetera. I want to suggest, and this is purely speculative, uh, I feel a little, a little uh, 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 rosy in the cheeks here because, because Noda and Santiago showed results from very thorough and, uh, uh, and, and uh, highly developed research. I'm going to show some very suggestive results from lines of research that I'm just beginning to pursue. But I want to argue that maybe we need to think about mediating factors, about things that stand between inequality and political outcomes that may explain why maybe inequality is not changing, but it is having a changing effect on political perceptions and political behavior. And I want to highlight two here, again, purely at the level of suggestions for uh, greater research. One is trust and legitimacy of institutions, trust in and legitimacy of institutions. And the second one is political regimes and electoral systems in Latin America. And my personal conviction, and I hope I, be, you know, I can begin to persuade you of that, is that these two areas are absolutely key. We need to study them much more thoroughly if we, under, we are to understand these connections between inequality and politics. Let me show you a couple of suggestive pictures. We have uh, from a couple of economists at the International Monetary Fund, a very nice variable uh, that uh, sort of is a continuous variable that measures the degree of political and social unrest. It, and it, it does not measure the number of people marching down the street. It measures the number of times that words surrounding or having to do with unrest appear in the press. Um, so uh, I, you know, this, this is not a sort of a once a year variable. It's a continuous variable that evolves over time. So you know, we can have a, an average for each year. And of course, we have a number of measures uh, of confidence in government and trust in government. We have, we have national sources for this. We have the Latino Barometro, which is reasonably homogeneous across Latin America. We also have, uh, you know, the, 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 the World Value Survey. Uh, so we know a little bit about, you know, uh, uh, what's been happening to confidence in government. We know that confidence in government has been falling, and I'll say a little bit more uh, uh, about that. But I just want to sort of get you thinking about this. Um, look at those scatter for three years, 16, 17, and 18. And I don't have the Latino barometer with every country for 19 yet. Uh, and what that seems to suggest is that, um, again, I'm not making any scientific claims about causality. This is just correlation. It is food for thought. There seems to be a, a, a negative slope to that line. That is to say, countries in which there's greater confidence in, 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 in government tend to have less social unrest. At the same time, if you think about countries which you know, used, used to have fairly peaceful uh, politics and where the politics has become a lot less stable recently, the poster child uh, uh, of that is Chile. Uh, if you ask me to find one variable that seems to have moved a lot recently and which at least seems to be correlated to the degree of uh, political instability and social uh, unrest, that is uh, you know, different measures of uh, trust in institutions. This is from a local Chilean polling firm that has been asking, you know, how much do you trust political parties, the Senate, the Catholic Church, the judiciary, the police? What you see is, you know, a slow decline uh, beginning in 1990. Of course, Chile had sort of a honeymoon at the beginning of the democratic period, but a very sharp decline more recently. Here's another uh, source. Um, uh, I will not take you through every category, but what is striking is particularly um, for some categories for which we have data in 2018 and 2019 is that in two years, you see an absolute collapse in the 
trust not only in political parties or government or Congress, but also in many other institutions, including you know private uh, business associations, labor unions, the Catholic Church, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm suggesting here is that, and I have you know I have a little model that I could uh, tell you about, but I will not because I don't have the time. There's perhaps a connection between the initial levels of distrust, which are somehow connected to inequality. People don't feel that institutions represent them. Uh, leaders seem out of touch. There are big gaps in income, in perceptions, in cultures across segments of society. And at given uh, uh, junctures, this causes both a collapse in trust and arguably also a collapse in satisfaction with government and a wave of unrest. I could elaborate more, I don't have the time, but I'd like to suggest that this is the kind of mediating factor that we need to be thinking about. Uh, let me just mention another one very briefly. Uh, Latin America has very peculiar political institutions. One way to organize one's thinking about political institutions is to point out that there are two kind of building blocks of political institutions. One is the political regime. You can have a presidential system as you have, say, in the US, or a parliamentary system as you have in Britain, much of continental Europe, India, and so many other countries. And of course, the other building block is the electoral system, which can be more majoritarian as it is in the Westminster system, or more proportional as it is, for instance, in continental Europe. You know, this kind of gives you a two by two matrix or four possible combinations. Latin America is unique in the world in having a presidential system and very proportional electoral arrangements. And the result of this increasingly, and this is, you know, this is not new, but I think these, uh, these results and these effects have become more marked recently for, for, for reasons that I could elaborate on. Uh, the effect is fragmented parliaments in which many parties have very small shares of total vote. Weakened political parties. Uh, if you go back two slides, you'll see that trust in political parties. Uh, and of course, you know, it's collapsing. The number of political parties is going uh, up the weight of each political party within a political system is going down very much. Systematically, we have minority governments in which uh, presidents are elected for four, five, six years, and they cannot govern because they cannot get anything done in Congress. And the result is deadlock and frustration. This has all you know, been uh, made perhaps more acute by the growing use of primaries and referenda that take power away from Congress and from established parties by growing political decentralization, which may be desirable for many other reasons, but not necessarily uh, makes life easy from the point of view of uh, governance. And of course, new media, social media, et cetera, uh, is uh, plausibly also complicating the picture. My take, and again, I'm engaged in some research along these lines, is that uh, maybe inequality provides sort of the starting point, but the way inequality is manifested uh, in political outcomes is very much mediated by this very particular set of political institutions, which you will not find elsewhere in the world, or at least not, you can find one or two cases, particularly in Eastern Europe, but they're not very, very common around the world, uh, and which uh, I think evidently are functioning very, very badly. And this may be also a, 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 a factor behind uh, you know, where it's evidently political uh, dissatisfaction, you know, with outcomes in Latin America nowadays. Um, last but not least, say, let me say one thing about one other factor of the uh, connection between politics and inequality. That is to say, you know, that the common and, and fully justified concern uh, on the outsized uh, effect of wealth on politics. You know, Latin America has a lot of rich people. The rich people wield political influence. That political influence is not the sort of thing we want in a democracy. And, you know, the question is, what do we do about it? Um, one uh, view, increasingly uh, popular nowadays, is that we should tax that wealth away. There may be economic reasons for doing this. Uh, it is less evident, uh, I think, uh, at least to me, that. Uh, taxing wealth away will have political effects for reasons that I will um, mention in a minute. Uh, alternative num number two is to try to change 
the rules that govern the effect of income inequality on economic outcomes, so competition law, antitrust, corporate governance, all of them matter. And last but not least, you can operate on the relevant margin directly, and that is to say you could change, or and countries are changing, the rules that govern uh, campaign finance and campaign finance in Latin America, which used to be quite uh, 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 opaque, is increasingly being brought uh, out into the open. I am of the view, and this is a view that is also associated with Larry Summers uh, in, in, in a debate that many of you have probably seen is on YouTube between uh, 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 between uh, 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 Saez and, 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 uh, and Summers. Um, I think the problem with the view that if you tax wealth away, suddenly politics will become more competitive and less unfair, it, that view simply gets all the right magnitudes confused um, because if there's not much data on this, but the actual expenditure, both official and unofficial on campaigns in Latin America is quite small, at least certainly compared to the amount spent in campaigns in, in North America. And as a result, if you take somebody who has 100 million and you tax away one or 2 million via wealth tax, that person is still gonna be left with 98. Will that have an effect on that person's ability to contribute to campaigns and to exercise an outsized uh, influence on political outcomes? I very much doubt it. So it seems to me that uh, a sound principle of political economy typically is to operate on the relevant margin to go straight where the difficulty is. And that is to say, we have a lot of room still in Latin America to improve what one might broadly call the rules of campaign finance. Caveat number one, of course, and I will end here, is that the political economy of that is tricky because you're asking the people who benefit from current arrangements to change those arrangements. Secondly, uh, the other caveat is the devil is in the detail. Uh, Chile did a big reform a couple of years ago. It is mostly headed in the right direction, but there are difficulties. For instance, if you uh, come up with very stringent limits on the amount that you can spend on, say, political advertising during a campaign, well, plausibly, you could argue that benefits incumbents because the incumbents are well known. They don't need uh, advertising. Uh, and in fact, it may set back challengers because the challengers are not so well known. They need that advertising. They need that social media exposure. If there are very strict limits on how much you can spend, maybe you're not making the system more competitive. Uh, arguably, you're making the system less competitive. I am not saying that we don't, do not need these kinds of reforms. We very much do. Uh, the point is that uh, one has to design them well. And there are lots of details that may have unexpected effects and which one can, you know, one needs to look at carefully. There's plenty of experience out there in developed countries that we can learn from. Uh, changes can be made and they have to be made. So let me just end here with a hope slash a conviction. Uh, this is the kind of debate um, that needs more data, that needs more research, that needs more finely defined hypotheses. And I am very, very confident that Lassir will do all of that. And as a result, the quality of the debate uh, on the relationship between inequality and politics in Latin America will improve massively as a result. Thank you very much, Chico. And let me stop there. So thank you very much, Andres. Uh, that was um, your hope and conviction are certainly a challenge uh, for us. There's a, a lot of work uh, to do. Now we're in the difficult position, Andres, before we started, Andres told me that I was too optimistic about the time and he was right. And so we are now in a position where I am both enormously you know, grateful and fortunate that we have two amazing discussants um, but also in a difficult position to ask them if they could perhaps speak for a little less time than uh, the 10 minutes I had asked them initially, if they can, uh, so that we can have a little bit more time for questions. So with that, um, let me hand over to um, Marcela Melendez, the UNDP Chief Economist for LAC. Marcela, you, of course, uh, have led this amazing uh, report on, uh, on, on Trapped uh, that, that maybe can provide some uh, guidance for the work that we're beginning now at, at last year. So we're looking forward to uh, hearing from you. Thank you, Chico. It's a great pleasure to participate in the launch of this uh, initiative that can be so important for the region. I will try to be very quickly. 
and bring some ideas to the table. Why does the region grow so poorly? The, our regional human development report argues that high inequality and low growth, low productivity are a not independent phenomena and that there are factors that underlie both of them. Uh, these are factors that if we were able to address properly should bring the region uh, in the proper direction uh, on, on both fronts, reducing inequality and, and improving growth. Our uh, report cannot uh, explore all of the factors that could, could like fall into this description. We look at concentration of power, at violence, and at poorly designed social protection systems. Uh, Santiago gave uh, already a flavor as, uh, with respect to, to how poorly designed social protection systems may harm uh, the region in both fronts, or at least not uh, help improve inequality while harming productivity growth. The point I want to make here is that I believe it is important to continue this joint conversation. I think we have been mistaken by thinking uh, about reducing inequality and improving growth as separate tracks. Reducing inequality is a productivity increasing policy. Increasing productivity is an inequality reducing policy. The dichotomy between equality and efficiency, I don't think applies to Latin America and the Caribbean. When we um, address concentration of power, we started by looking at, at markets, at market power and market structure. And what, what becomes very evident is that the income distribution in Latin America and the business size distribution are very similar. Uh, when we include uh, um, in the business size distribution also unipersonal businesses and all of the people who are working in self-employment. In the upper tail, we have these giant firms that uh, are in few hands, concentrated ownership is more concentrated than in, in advanced economies. These are firms that are also high productivity relative to the rest, not necessarily relative to their peers in other regions of the world, but, but relative to the rest in, in our countries they are. And they operate with high market power and high, have high political power. Uh, until here, the story is quite similar uh, to that of the rest of the world. However, what we're finding is that in the lower tail, we have a high share of labor that is occupied in a multitude of unipersonal or tiny businesses that are uh, low productivity and, and that uh, result in very low personal incomes. That tail is much thicker than in the rest of the world and in advanced economies. And uh, we are uh, saying that this is an additional focus that we should have when we look at inequality and, and uh, productivity in Latin America and the Caribbean. The global conversation about uh, concentration cannot be directly imported to think about inequality in Latin America. The, the story of the upper tail is part of the story, but uh, unless we look at the, at the lower tail, which makes us so particular, we're probably not going to, to be able to actually counteract concentration at the top. <laughs> the conversation that I had prepared, I, I think connects uh, best with what Andres Velasco uh, was, was telling us a bit. In a question that we uh, included in Latino Barometer last year, we, we find that 77% 77 of Latin Americans think that their countries are governed in the interest of a few powerful groups and a quarter of them point at big businesses. So the interference of uh, economic elites in policy making is often part of the problem. That, that con high market power and concentration at the top, and the top, at the top hurts uh, our countries in, in, in several ways, but particularly through its interference in, in policy making. Because of this interference, our fiscal systems are weak in terms of, ta of tax collection, Nora, so that's how a uh, tax income relative to GDP is very low in many of our countries and not progressive in, in many of them too. Uh, and also competition policy and, and competition agencies are weak or even non-existent in many countries. A few uh, days ago, uh, I heard James Robinson say uh, this, this phrase, uh, the real problem in Latin America is not the leads, but the way in which they behave. And this has a lot to do with rules, how they are shaped and, and enforced. And uh, I fully agree, but 
the, the, the concern is that these rules and these institutions are often endogenous, aren't they, to, to political power. So I think unless we are able to somehow tackle political power, we are um, at, a, at a road, uh, at, at, at an end of the road that is, that is hard to, to overcome. I heard this, this sentence, you need to change minds to change politics in a conversation between Ezra Klein in his podcast with the writer, political uh, Richard uh, Powers, and I thought this resonates with me. I think this is uh, the real challenge that we are going to, to face, and I think that last year, uh, last year faces, because we are full of diagnostics, and of course we can always improve them and understand better what is going on, but unless we are able to change minds, we are not going to be able to change politics, and I think that's part of the the problem holding us back. So I wanted to uh, just suggest some, some uh, lines of, I don't know if this is lines of research or lines of conversation that we should begin. And one of them is uh, definitely the media. The media are shaping who we are. When we uh, watch television, uh, a long time ago we were passive receivers. Now we have become manipulated activists. We have algorithm, algorithms that are, uh, uh, playing a, a, a horrible, obscure game in, in uh, political pol polarization and in political attitudes. Technology supercharged some parts of our natural impulses. I don't know what the answers are to the things that I have on this slide, but I think these are uh, things that we need to look at carefully. How do we transit to working democracies? Friend of us, economist uh, Ernesto Shadrosky once said, I heard him say, I belong to a generation that wants democracy and not the revolution. I think we're far from having working democracies in our countries. We have a large chunks of the population that have no political voice that are unable to participate. I think that's what we are seeing on the streets in many of the countries of, in Latin America, people that feel that they have no interlocutor among uh, people who are making decisions. And then we think, I, I think we have the challenge of how uh, to figure out uh, how, how to communicate better uh, and build consensus around roots for the form, including consensus with powerful elites. I think we need to work uh, with elites. And I think we're very good at talking among each other and among economists. We understand each other. But I think we are in uh, circle conversations. And, 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 I, and I think there is a big challenge in coming out of this loop. And then finally, looking towards the future, we probably need to think, rethink education and education systems, both in form and in content, because we are not being able to produce uh, children and people who are actually able to adapt, innovate, learn, and think independently. And I don't think that will come out just by uh, extending coverage or continuing to to do things as, as we do it in the region. So I think these are issues that I wish last year would tackle, eh, because I, I think if, if we were able to find some answers, we would be able to move the conversation forward. Last but not least, let, let's not forget violence as one uh, feature that characterizes our region. Latin America is the most violent region of, uh, of the world, and violence disproportionately affects the most vulnerable. Through, through that, it perpetuates and amplifies pre-existent inequalities. Also, it impedes human capital accumulation and it deviates public resources and distorts private investment, uh, hurting productivity and growth. There's a lot of um, things that we cannot uh, address directly from multilateral organizations, but people in academia have the freedom to address important conversations like the one that should arise around the traffic of illicit substances, which is one of the primary causes of violence in Latin America. I close there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcella. That was great. And thank you also for um, sticking to time. Um, without further ado, let me give the, the last word amongst the, uh, the speakers to Jim Robinson. I think you can, yeah, that we're not, you won't, you're not going to have any time for questions though, are you? I, I don't know how important that is. I can try to be staggeringly brief. Uh, if you 
can, Jim, that would be great, but we also don't want to lose out on, on what you, uh, what well, you have you to say. Back, you can invite me back another time, I suppose. Certainly. <laughs> okay. Uh, oops. All right. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So, so, yeah. so let me, you know, let me say, uh, let me try to say something different, uh, which is uh, Andres was talking a little bit about um, about uh, about political economy and politics and political institutions. But you know, when I when I look at Latin America and and I try to think about inequality and you know the sources of inequality and the dynamics of inequality. I think I, I tend to be more, I think the politics is very important, but I think the sociology is very important too. So, so I would urge you to think hard about the sociology of inequality and the reproduction of inequality and hierarchy. And, you know, here's the, you know, the way I always like to illustrate it in Bogota, which is, which is, you know, the maids uniform section of Cachivaches, which is a big department store in the elite part of Bogota, you know, where you can go to get your, a maid, a uniform, where you can bring your maid, you know, so she could choose her own uniform, which is very common if you hang out there, you know, I mean, it's not a, it's not a usual t tourist attraction, but it, I, I find it very entertaining. Anyway, here's the reproduction of domestic service and inequality and hierarchy and elites and subservient classes. And, you know, I think, I think, I think, I think you should think a lot about that, because actually I also think that's changing a lot in Latin America. And thinking that through is, is a cause of optimism that, that might not show itself, up, show itself up in Gini coefficients or the top 1% income share uh, or, or anywhere else. And, and also I would think, thinking about elites, you know, if you're thinking about sociology, the reproduction of class structures and inequality, you think about elites. And the other thing I think to bear in mind about elites in in Latin America, you know, this is something that Marcella just said, you know, which is that is, you know, elites are much less hegemonic in Latin America than, than they might appear to be. A lot of this literature on inequality emphasizes a lot the incredibly hegemonic nature of elites in Latin America, like lying behind this persistence of inequality. You know, but but here's an example from Colombia, which I which is very interesting, you know, which is which is actually the elites in Bogota, they might seem hegemonic if you're sitting in Cachivaches, but actually they don't control half of the country. Half of the country is, is, is sort of anarchic and controlled by regional elites, national elites. There's an enormous amount of, you know, what the great sociologist Pareto would have called circulation of elites. You know, here's an example of three elites sitting in Congress, uh, addressing Congress. They're being applauded by Congress, you can see. And, you know, who are they? They're warlords. They're three warlords, Ernesto by Salvatore Mancuso and Ramon Isaza. They're warlords who emerged in peripheral Colombia with thousands of troops under arms out of the scope of the government. They're negotiating with the government. And that's what happens in many Latin American countries. So I think it's good to get that image in mind that Though there are elites and there is hegemonic elites and there's lots of elites that are not very hegemonic, there's large open spaces out of the control of elites. And in those spaces, many things can happen. Warlords can emerge. Alternative political projects can emerge. And you see that everywhere once you start looking for it in Latin America. You know, here's, a, here's an example, Peronism. You know, Peronism has a bad word amongst economists, you know. Uh, but, you know, it's a bad word. They have a bad reputation amongst economists. But actually, Peronism was a genuine social revolution. You know, anyone who's been in, say, Colombia or Guatemala, you know, and in Argentina, and you just compare those societies at the level of social relations and social interactions, Argentina is much less hierarchical in the same... It's not hierarchical in the same way Colombia or Guatemala is. You know, and here's the descamisados, you know, the shirtless ones. He is a shirtless one with his feet sitting in the, in the, in the fountain. You know, uh, uh, you know, this is a famous day in 1945 where Perón's shirtless ones paraded in Buenos Aires and got him out of uh, prison. You know, so now it's a kind of, it's a, it's, a, it's a sanctified day in the Peronist calendar. But this was, who were the shirtless ones? They were the people from the interior. They were the people that Perón mobilized into a social movement that overturned traditional elites in, in Argentina, and they're running the country as we speak. So this was a social 
revolution from the periphery taking over the center. And, you know, that's, you might think Peronism, okay, so, you know, but that doesn't look like, like such a great thing. Fine, but there's many other different types of projects happening right at this minute, you know, in Latin America. Here's an example from Peru. In 1980s, when Alan Garcia was president for the first time, he had his 12 apostles, and his 12 apostles were, were business elites, business tycoons, who he, he negotiated with. And here they are. You can see, you can see this, the names of the companies, and they're from Lima, and Lima, and Lima, and Lima, and you get the picture. They're all uh, mostly white Lemeño elites. Here's the 12 apostles today on the right. This is from a book by a, by a Peruvian sociologist called Francisco Durand. What's striking about this is some of the same companies are there, run by the descendants of the people who were there in 1986, but half of them are completely different. They're from the interior, they're from Cajamarca, they're from Ayacucho. They're not from the coast, they're from, they're from the Sierra. And if you look at who they are, you know, here's the, here's the 12 CEOs of the current 12 apostles in Peru, according to Duran. You know, and, and if you look at who these people are, you know, especially the gentlemen at the bottom, you see these people from the interior, they're also, they're not white Lemeño elites. They're what in Peru would be called cholos. President Toledo used to call himself cholo. So there's been a tectonic change in Peruvian society, both at the political level, look at the gentleman who's president now, and at the kind of socio-cultural level and at the level of entrepreneurship and business ownership, okay? So this is a massive sociological change in Peru, which I think has enormous consequences for uh, inequality and social mobility. And where were the elites? The elites were there. Why didn't the elites stop this? Because they couldn't stop it, like in Colombia, and because, as Nora said to start with, Nora Lustig said to start with, because there's democracy. Democracy takes time to sink in. It takes time to show change and benefits for people to kind of decompress from decades or maybe centuries of autocratic rule. But, but it's happening. It's happening. And there's spaces for it to happen. And, you know, one final piece of, I deleted some slides while Marcella was talking because I could see this was going to happen. One final piece of evidence from, a, from, from, a, from, a, from, a, from some research that I've been doing with two of my colleagues, Carlos Molina and Pablo Celaya, which is in Bolivia. Fantastic example. The mass. Who are the mass? The cocaleros, people, coca growers, indigenous people, women, uh, mobilizing where? In the periphery, outside the control of elites, with a political project to dramatically change uh, society. Okay, what's, what's the evidence of that? Well, here's a little bit of evidence that we have, which is the propensity of indigenous people to give an indigenous first name to their child. What happened in 2005? Evo Morales was elected president in Bolivia. What you see since 2005 is actually a 75% increase in the propensity of indigenous people to give their child an indigenous name. What's that? That's an empowerment of indigenous people. You go to Bolivia, you go to El Alto, it's dramatic, dramatic empowerment of indigenous people, of women. There's a tectonic social change going on in, in Bolivia. And what we've seen in the last couple of years in Bolivian politics is that genie can't be put back into the bottle. So, 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 so I would urge the panel to think more about the sociology of inequality in Latin America and how that may be changing in very interesting ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. That was both brilliant and short, uh, exactly what we needed. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm delighted to say that, um, that um, LSE events, which are normally a very strict with time, have said that we can have an extra five minutes so that we can take, take some questions. And so we've had um, a lot of questions uh, in the Q&A function. I've been reading them. Uh, and um, uh, I, for some reason, I'm not seeing the right thing. OK. So I, what I'd like to do now is ask um, the, the panelists all to turn on their uh, screens again uh, to, so, that, so that we can all uh, see one another. Um, and what I'll do is I'll read three. You know, there were more than 30 questions. I'm going to read uh, uh, three of them. Um, and then I'm going to give uh, our, um, our three panel members who spoke first. 
are not a, a Santiago and Andres, but in the opposite order. So I'll start with Andres and go to Santiago uh, and then Nora. Um, and, and each of them will have one minute, one minute <laughs> to pick one of these questions that I'm going to read um, and answer them. So I'm going to read them uh, quickly. Uh, one from Chris Matheson is about unions. How strong or weak are trade unions and, and labor and union laws in the worst performing countries in, in Latin America? And how fractured is the union movement? Too many unions uh, may lead them to fight amongst themselves rather than fight in a unified way. So that's a question about unions. Um, and again, I'm going to go Andres, Santiago, and Nora. Okay. Another question from uh, Paul Hasselbring is one actually that is um, something that's worrying us a lot in the last year panel. And uh, he says, given Nora Lustig's presentation, if the macro situations and profiles uh, and the sources of inequality in Latin America are so heterogeneous, but inequality is still such a defining characteristic of the region, is there a united narrative of inequalities in Latin America? What's the common thread? Um, and finally, a question from Aria Petre, who uh, is in, in, uh, in, so Nora says she's not allowed to turn on the camera, so somebody can please let her do that. Um, Aria Petre, who's a, a student at grade 12, a high school student from Dubai, um, asks Nora specifically, but anyone can take that as well, is, is the reduction in inequality through a decreasing skill premium actually something we want? Uh, and she goes on, but I'll leave it there. So there was a question about inequality falling through the skill premium, a question about is there a unifying narrative, and a question about unions. Uh, we'll have those five minutes that LSE events has kindly given us. Let me ask you to please stick to one minute and start with Andres, please. Thank you, Chico. Uh, I'm going to talk about unions and about elites, but before that, I'll simply say, of course we want inequality to change because we want the skill premium to drop. So I am getting ahead of Nora's answer. I'm wondering if Nora and I will agree on this point or not. Unions, are unions strong? Well, again, it depends where you look. Unions are very strong in Argentina. They're somewhat strong in Brazil. They're not very strong at all in Central America. What kinds of unions? Public sector unions are pretty strong. Private sector unions, not necessarily. But even there, you're seeing new private sector unions uh, arise in new sectors. Traditionally, the most unionized uh, uh, sectors of the economy were industry, but of course, as economies have de-industrialized and uh, as services have become more important, you have rising unions in retail and shopping malls in other kinds of services. The broader point here, uh, and I'm gonna echo something Jim said here, is that for way too many, too many years, too many decades, too many centuries, the narrative and the discussion on inequality in Latin America has been one of the elite and the rest, you know, the elite and the people, the powerful and the powerless. The point Jim makes, which I happen to agree with uh, 110%, is that that narrative is completely and totally useless today. Uh, we are witnessing several revolutions of Latin America, one of which is the fragmentation of power, uh, the rise of new elites, whether it be elites outside the capital, whether it be elites outside the traditional confines of Bogota and Buenos Aires and Santiago's private schools and private universities. We're seeing a fragmentation of political power through the growth of new political parties and movements. Much of this is good. It is energizing, it is uh, refreshing, it, it shows dynamic societies. Uh, some of it is tricky to handle, of course, because when you have a lot of fragmentation uh, and governance becomes an issue, getting laws passed becomes an issue uh, and moving countries forward becomes an issue. But um, I think it is absolutely the right time to change the basic component of, of, of that debate. This is not the elites against the rest. This is a set of multipolar uh, societies with different kinds of elites. And I think understanding those dynamics uh, uh, are, you know, that's precisely the challenge that Lassie or any other scholar wants to tackle as we go forward. I could go on, but I will stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Andres. Over Santiago. Thank you, Chico. So, so let me take uh, Paul's question, whether there's a united narrative of inequality for the region. 
And I think that, that the answer is, is very difficult because at the end of the day, the region is a very heterogeneous place. You know, if you think of Chile on one end and maybe Honduras at the other end, there's, there's a big continuum of countries with different levels of complexity. So it, it's, it, I, I could not think of a single narrative. What I can think of are themes and two or three themes that apply with different strengths in different countries. One theme is in using the language that Marcela used. At the top, there are a set of people that are concentrating income, either because they might be very, very powerful unions, like in education, or because they're entrepreneurs that can collect rents because they exploit monopoly power, or because there's some politicians that are being corrupt. So at the top, there's a lot happening that is concentrating income. And that's kind of a narrative that with different weights applies to different parts of Latin America. And then as another theme is, look, there are all these low income, low productivity workers that are not benefiting from the process of growth that are being excluded. They might be getting some income transfers, but still it's not enough to really change inequality. And that's kind of the story that I told. And again, that applies with different strengths to different parts of to different countries. I think it's not a very relevant story when I think of Chile. I think it's a very relevant story when I think of Peru or Colombia or Mexico. Uh, there, there would be a third theme, and I'll stop here, for which we know very little, and maybe in the Lassier theme we can talk about, uh, which is the, the inequality coming from the rich innovator, you know, the Jeff Bezos and the, and, and, and the guys who, you know, the, the Elon Musk, who increase inequality in this was extremely rich, but this is coming from innovation and from, from technology, you know, from, from new things. We don't know enough about that. So close, not a single narrative, themes that apply with different strengths across different parts of the region. Thank you, Chico. Thank you, Santiago. Nora, in one minute, please. Yes, uh, so let me talk about the narrative and uh, sort of disagree slightly with Santiago. I do think that there is a common narrative. First of all, something that we haven't addressed today, and I don't know where it's going to be addressed also in last year, I think that at the root of the uh, very high and persistent inequality in Latin America lie ethnic and racial inequities that have proven to be very, very, very difficult to overcome. And uh, I think that's the seed of inequality throughout more than a century that's happened, uh, or two centuries, whatever, you know, if you want to go back to the conquest time. Uh, that I think has been, uh, if you want to address to some extent, through a process of inclusion by expanding access to education. So I would say that one of the common narratives that I have discovered that is systematic in the region is that access to education has been an equalizing factor primarily through what happens to the skill premium. Because not, to, I mean, we can go into that Chico, but we know that not necessarily the um, educational endowment equalization results in equalizing factors, but certainly the fact that you have more people with skills and fewer people with no skills has resulted in a decline in the skill premium and that has helped inequality reduction. And that's why I say we have to be fearful of the impact of the pandemic. And uh, no, I think that uh, Andres said, we need to welcome this process of reducing skill premiums that's narrowing the wage gap. And that's how inequality in advanced countries actually decline and also how it rises when it's the skill premium that goes up for the reasons that it does is when inequality rises. And it's totally consistent to have declining skill premia and economic growth, that was one of the comments. So I think that the common narrative for me is, how do you break the uh, sort of inherited divisions that I think come from ethnic and racial inequities? Education plays a fundamental role. And now with the pandemic, I think we're facing a new challenge to make sure that what we made progress in the educational front is not undone.
Oops. Thank you very much, Nora. Um, we're now at the end of our time. In fact, a little bit past. Let me uh, thank events and interpreters for having stayed with us. Let me thank uh, our five speakers, Nora Lustig, Santiago Levy, Andres Velasco, particularly Marcela Melendez and uh, Jim Robinson, who joined us as brilliant discussants. Um, and most of all, let me thank all of you, the, the 400 people who joined and 240 who, who still stayed until the end. This is the beginning of a conversation. We look forward in the next five years to interacting with you um, and, and dealing with more questions uh, uh, in, in, in that time. So thank you all very much for joining. Goodbye.